This podcast is made possible by Avalara and Ledge. I am Alejandro Castro, CFO of Onyx, and you're listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 993. The vendor that was providing the call system had gone to a leasing agent for these call systems and they sold it to us like it was a, a capital asset. And then it disappeared off into the sunset. You know, if I'd been in the US and um, the general manager said like, it's okay, we solved it. I would have thought, no problem, let's move on. You know, I'm sure you're doing the right thing. Wouldn't have felt the need to, to say anything. In Asia, it'd be a little bit more consultative. So how exactly have you sold that? Tell me a little bit more information. And then you, you kind of realize that, you know, <laughs> it was a great creative idea. Oh, let's jailbreak it so we can use it. Uh, yeah. And obviously I said, yeah, no, that's a hard no. We're not going to do that, you know. Hi, it's Jack. On today's episode, we speak with Hillary Norris, CFO of G Treasury. 14 years ago, Hillary Norris tells us she had the ultimate dream job at a tech company in sunny California, a perfect alignment of professional goals and personal life. However, the idyllic scenario was disrupted when the company was acquired, a common turning point that often spells uncertainty for many executives. Facing a potential career setback, Norris was initially marked for replacement but was later asked to stay on and lead the finance operations of the combined entity. You'll hear about that story and much more on today's episode when we speak to Hillary Norris about her international career in corporate finance. We'll begin after this. You know the feeling. A report deadline is looming and your team is buried in spreadsheets with tasks like bank and payment processor reconciliations, journal entry prep, and cash flow reporting. But what if there was a better way? Ledge automates the tedious work that slows your team down, like high-volume transaction matching, journal entry creation, and even cash flow forecasting. Ledge glues all of your financial data together, across your ERP, banks, payment processors, data warehouse, and more, and automates any workflow, no matter how complex or unique to your business. Get real-time cash flow visibility and make cash reporting and forecasting effortless while increasing controls and accuracy. And Ledge requires no IT or R&D resources. Ledge plugs right into your existing stack so you can get set up in just a few hours. Imagine a world where your team can close the books faster with fewer resources. Imagine audit-ready data all year round. With Ledge, you can finally stop scaling headcount just to keep up with growth. Visit ledge.co, that's ledge.co, to learn more about how you can automate your finance operations without the heavy lift. Hello, we're speaking with Hillary Norris, CFO of G Treasury. Hillary, welcome. Thank you very much. So, Hillary, as you uh, probably know by now, we begin by asking you to look back. And what we're interested in are those experiences you feel really prepared you to become a finance leader. What comes to mind for you? Well, top of mind, I think... And this holds true not just for finance leadership, but uh, any leadership, is resilience. Whatever you do, if you step into a progressive career, you know, the road is not always a straight one. Um, And you will have uh, positive things and negative things things happen. So being resilient, and I'll just give you an example. So um, my first Business unit, business unit CFO role. Uh, it was my dream job. It was a tech company based in, in Irvine in California. So there I was, 
you know, young family, dream job, living the California dream, um, yeah, bit of skiing, bit of beach. It was fabulous. Um, and unfortunately, the company got bought. Now, for any of you that have been in that situation as a CFO, you know, you've pretty much got a target on your back. Um, and I think it's fair to say it was a, it was a bit of a roller coaster. So, um, you know, somebody spent, somebody, like a company spent a huge amount of money to, to, to buy you. They, they want their guy in there. Uh, but after much toing and froing, they asked me to stay on um, as a CFO for the combined organization. I was thinking, fantastic, this is great. Um, unfortunately, the, the acquirer um, was, uh, uh, was a German-based company. Um, and you know, diversity was not <laughs> was not uh, really their strong point. Um, and I started to see some of the uh, the, the kind of red flags as as, as we progressed. Um, so the first thing was I was acquired, and there were five technology divisions to this company. And I looked around the room of all the five um, business units. I was the only woman. <laughs> so you're like, okay. I'm good with that. I'm happy to be, you know, the trailblazer. You know, bring it on. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Um, the next, next thing that happened was uh, they were going through um, my uh, compensation package to move from being a, a UK expat to being a, a German expat, um, and we come across this thing, and it's like spousal allowance, and I'm like, I'm taken aback. Um, and that their view on it was, oh, you know, aren't we a, a generous company? Um, but the underlying message is no dual careers. So, you know, not many women, no dual careers. Uh, yeah, it was a bit, red, bit of big, big red flag. So, you know, over the course of time, it just didn't work out because there was just no kind of cultural fit there. Um, there was no way that we could progress dual careers, myself and my husband, um, and so, we, you know, we end up very amicably passing in the ways. So, you know, the resilience of going through that roller coaster. And actually, you know, as one door closes, another door opens up. Um, and I landed a fantastic regional role um, uh, running 17 businesses uh, across Asia Pacific. So, you know, resilience, I think, is incredibly important because not everything's going to go your way. Um, and you need to be able to bounce back and lean in. Uh, and move forward. So that would be my absolute number one top tip. <laughs> Your career has brought you to how many parts of the world? Can you just list some of the geographies? Yeah. So, I mean, you could probably guess my accent. I was not born in the US. So I was born in the UK. Um, and my career uh, has taken me across Europe, um, through Asia Pacific, and here to the US. And it's been an amazing adventure. Um, so, hugely exciting and i've loved every minute of it so and it began as you just described okay it began in the uk but is it the netherlands or where do you go to next so yeah i went uh went to the netherlands lived just outside uh amsterdam uh for a couple of years um and then we uh we moved to to boston uh east coast uh which was a great introduction to the us um and then off to california um, then off to Asia, and I was based out of Singapore, um, and then back here to the US. So, and not I'm not matching the geographies, but I just want to mention some of the some of the companies you were part of: Henkel, Unilever, Quest International. Not that order either. I'm just listing no. them off very quickly. And and along the way, you invested uh, certain companies. You invested as many as six years with. And I'm sure there are other companies. As far as your spouse together, were you building careers in different parts of the world or, you know, it becomes rather challenging or what would you tell us? I don't know. Maybe there were compromises along the way. Uh, so we all, always come together. Um, we might have like a lagging or a leading, uh, leading for a, a couple of months. I uh, want to go and set things up, you know, one, two, one, two, to join. Um I think we identified quite early on uh, that if we wanted to make this work and both pursue a career, uh, we had to choose our options that were quite fungible. Yeah. So, you know, I am super, super lucky. You know, I have the most wonderful husband, partner, 
um, everything you can imagine. Um, but uh, he's been he's been great in terms of always choosing a profession and, and taking his own career journey that is is very movable. So he's always uh, been able to pursue his career alongside mine, and that's been and that's been fantastic. So, okay, Resi- resilience, um, mm-hmm. and you emphasize that word from the very beginning. And I'm wondering what the greater lesson is here: be resilient. You have to know that change is going to happen, whether it's an acquisition, whether it's a, a new senior uh, executive team coming in. How am I doing? Uh, resilience. Why did you? choose that word to sort of characterize yourself or your career, resilience? Because uh, any career that you're in has always got setbacks. Uh, if somebody told me that their uh, their entire career has always gone like according to plan, I, I, I would be, you know, <laughs> very suspect of it uh, because, you know, nothing ever goes quite according to plan. You know, I took that role. Um, thinking it was going to be my dream job um, and it was all going to go, you know, incredibly smoothly. Um, And then, you know, a few months in, boom, you know, you're looking at a new ownership structure. And, you know, how do you cope with that? You've got to be, you know, front foot, lean in. You've got to be that optimist. You've got to assume that, you know, just do my best. It'll work out fine. But you have to be resilient to those setbacks. Um, because otherwise, you you know you can you can spiral negative behaviors. So you know, resilience, lean in, and optimistic. and what you said there too is how do you respond to that? It's not you know you could take a quite a thumping, but it's how you get up again <laughs> and uh, and and pick up the pieces or look for the opportunity that you just can't see uh, where you're currently standing. Please continue. I'm sorry I interrupted. No problem at all. Another example I, w- I would say in terms of uh, sort of your career and building, uh, learn to kind of flex your leadership style. Um, and particularly true for the international placements, we, you know, we've talked about that, is that, you know, in certain circumstances, you know, leading from the front, you know, being more directive, leaning it, that's that's one way of handling it. Another way would be be much more consultative. And I, I just, I'll tell you one example. <laughs> um so uh, it was in Asia Pacific. I was in this regional CFO role, and a general manager from um, one of the countries phoned up to say, um, "Hillary, uh, we were they were installing a telephone system um, for a call center there." And she leans, uh, she's uh, she calls up and says, "Hillary, um, we've been cheated. The vendor that was providing the call system had." gone to a leasing agent for these call systems, had leased the equipment, they'd um, come to us and they'd sold it to us like it was a a capital asset. And then it disappeared off into the sunset. So picture this office, you know, an old PBS like call system in the corner, you know, and a distraught general manager. So it's like, oh, okay, you know, that's a really tricky situation. She says, but it's okay. We've solved it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, tell, tell, me, tell me how you've solved it. Well, we know somebody that can jailbreak the system, so we can still install it and it'll all be perfectly fine. I'm like, whoa, 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 stop the bus. <laughs> so, you know, if I'd been in the US and um, the general manager said, like, it's okay, we solved it, I would have thought, no problem, let's move on, you know, I'm sure you're doing the right thing, wouldn't have felt the need to, to say anything. In Asia, you know, be a little bit more consultative. So how exactly have you solved that? Tell me a little bit more information. And then you, you kind of realize that, you know, it was a great creative idea. Oh, let's jailbreak it so we can use it. Uh, yeah, but how long is it going to be before the leasing company turns up and wants their piece of kit back? So, um, yeah, just being able to kind of flex your style. And obviously, I, I said, yeah, no, that's a hard no. We're not going to do that. You know, that's why we have insurance and you know, step them through. This is what this is what the solution is like. So, you know, I, I like to describe, you know, 
working in the US, which you know most people on your call will, will be, you know, obviously intimate with. You know, when you're leading a team in finance, it feels like you're a you're a NASCAR driver. You're zooming around that track, but you've got you know your backup team that changes your tires, the guys that fuel it. Perfect. You know, you're leading in Asia. It's more like Ben Hur at the Coliseum. Yeah, you're you're still going around the track. You're still going fast. It's super exciting, but you, you're kind of like trying to steer the car to make sure you know you don't hit the obstacle and the wheels fall off. So quite often, very high paced, very forward looking, um, but you have to to use a slightly different style and mindset with how you're addressing you know, these situations. Yeah. So flex style, different mindset very much in terms of the situation you find yourself in. Um, so, I, And I, I want to ask, uh, and I believe you shared this with us, that it was um, this transition, you were living in California, and then the door swung open to this operation in Asia. You went for it. No hesitation. Hadn't worked in Asia before, as far as I can tell. But there wasn't a hesitation in your mind, nothing. And, and just to reveal how you think a little bit or where, were you, uh, pe- did people think you're crazy or, you know, to try to try to discourage you in some way? No, I, I mean, again, to kind of, uh, you, you know, you always have to uh, make uh, uh, well thought through judgment calls. I mean, you do that in your personal life, you do that in, in your home life. Um, I had some experience of Asia because working in tech when I was on, you know, in California on the West Coast, um, it was a business unit I had for a global business. So, um, you know, I was stepping into, you know, I was in factories in uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, China. So I knew the region, but not to live in region. So I, I wasn't stepping completely. Um, you know, into- I should make the distinction that we have a good number of finance leaders who might get uh, an assignment. Uh, for a period overseas with the same company, but what you're doing and what I think is a little bit courageous is, is changing companies and, you know, joining, I, I don't know, what were you based in Singapore, yes. moving to Singapore, right. um, yeah. you know, from California with a new company, um, yeah. which is, is, which is rather daring. And uh, just as you look back now, it, 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 from what I could tell, it was the responsibility, uh, the challenges were in line with things you'd already tackled, um, it was a CFO, uh, a regional CFO responsibility over many right. companies. How am I doing? <laughs> yeah, perfect. I mean, I, I guess I've probably always been a risk taker in that respect from a very early stage. Um, you know, when we moved first to the Netherlands, as I said, it was kind of the first post that I went to. Um, it was actually in the context of, you know, it was the first time I was working abroad. It was, so it was, I was going into a new job. It was an assignment. It was a. It was a. It was the same company, but it was. It was a new job. My husband was moving into a new job. Um, we were moving location, and I actually made the change while I was on maternity leave. Um, so we had a newborn daughter. So you know, if you talk about like <laughs> number of things that that you change all at the same time, it was like two new jobs, a new home. Um, and a new baby all in one go. Um, and I think it, it was a challenge, but it taught, you know, both my husband and I a lot about, you know, what we like and, you know, we have that both have that sense of adventure. So, you know, as long as you, you, you do it open-mindedly, you have the conversation and say, hey, let, let's go for it. Um, we're all in this together. Um, we'll, we'll, um, you know, we'll talk, we'll communicate, we'll make sure that, uh, you know, uh, we make it work on the way, you know, you do that once and, you know, the world is yours. You realize what are the kind of the gives and takes that you have to do to kind of, uh, to, to make it successful. Um, and it was always making sure, for example, you know, my daughter was going to be, you know, or our daughter, I should say, um, was going to be super happy you know my husband could always continue to pursue his career and it looked like a super exciting job so yeah yeah it's thoughtful it's not quite as crazy as it might seem but i know a lot of people won't do it yeah 
I just want to also mention that uh, I think your your first job, I believe, was with Unilever, which you stepped in sort of on the finance side of things or an, as an IT product manager originally, and then you become a finance manager. Um, so it's revealing in a way in that I, from there, I imagine you got more involved in FP&A projects within companies, distinguishing you from going on the accounting track is what I, I'm uh, pointing out. Uh, how, how am I doing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean quite correct. Uh, and again, you know, your listeners are probably more U.S. based and they might not necessarily, uh, you know, um, you know, understand the UK system quite so well. Um, so this is a little bit my fun fact, but uh, um, in terms of uh, what do people not know about me? Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll pitch it in here. Um, I actually trained as a scientist. Okay, um, I was the uh, the scholarship girl from South London. <laughs> I've lost my accent now, um, and I, you know, I eventually got a place at Oxford University, um, and there I studied biochemistry and was on track to be be an academic um but it decided that you know as the, as the world opened up that wasn't necessarily the, you know the the life that was really going to suit me um and in the uk um there are less certainly in my day there were very few business schools you didn't go into business from um via a business school you actually went into business through top universities. So um, obviously Unilever is a huge um, multinational based out of the, of the UK and the Netherlands. And they um, you know, offered me a role to join their management um, you know, b- business scheme where they taught you to you know, be a business person. So I then did all my accountancy with uh, with Unilever at the same time as sort of progressing through their sort of management training and, and, and all of that fun stuff. So it's a slightly different career path, I think, for, you know, a UK person than, than necessarily a, a US person where it's more classically MBA and business school and, and, and that type of stuff. So it is a little bit different. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, you end up at the same place. Where were you when a CFO perhaps tapped you on the shoulder or a more senior executive tapped you on the shoulder and asked you to step in to uh, help them present something uh, to the upper management or even a board? I don't know. But as you think back in time, I think there's always that moment where we need Hillary in that room with us tomorrow. Let's make that happen. Can you recall anything like that? We're, and I'm curious whether it might have come earlier in your career. I'm curious, and my suspicion is probably. Yeah, again, I think in uh, larger businesses, and again, this is um, uh, a reflection really on my early career. I, mean, I spent the first 25 years in you know very large multinationals. It doesn't happen as soon as what you're going to say, clearly. You're not going to be in front of the board right away, I don't think, at Unilever no. anyway. Yeah. yeah, oddly enough, um, you do get a little bit of board exposure fairly early on. Um, if you sort of come in through things like the um, management training schemes, because what they like to do is um, get you that line of sight into what does it look like to sit around the table right. with Give you a sense you know, of it. Yep. Uh, with uh, with the board. So you're there more as an observer um, <laughs> and quite cutely like a little bit of the bag carrier for somebody where you might have some, you know, fun facts or figures uh, that, you, that you have at, at your fingertips that um, it, that gives you at least the line of sight and it gives you that sense of, you know, if I look that 10, 15, whatever years on, is this this, this something that, that I'd like to do? Um, you know, oddly enough, when you finally get there as, uh, and you're sitting around the table, sometimes it's not necessarily, in, you know, such a kind of comfortable circumstances, shall I say. Um, so, again, in, in, in large corporates, certainly if a, a CFO or a divisional CFO you know, your expectations are you have to attend things like audit committees on a uh, on a regular basis to present you know, what's going on um, in your part of the, wo- the world and 
particularly if there are some uh, some, some issues. Um, then, and obviously in Asia Pacific, when I, I, I jumped in there, um, it was quite a challenging environment because prior to um, myself and some new people that came in, it had not been run particularly ethically. So we did have some sort of challenges around cleanup that meant, you know, turning up to audit committees to say, well, you know, unfortunately we found this situation in this country and this situation in that country, you know, cleaning it up and, and this is the plan. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily quite as comfortable as it looked like in those, those, <laughs> those early days, you know. Well, I've taken you in quite a few, number of different directions here, but I want to just ask, is there something that you wanted to share that you think is an important component of, of that career path? Um, I, I probably would talk about, you know, trust your team, particularly as you grow, um, because if you want to grow and scale, uh, you, you need to be able to, uh, you know, take a much bigger scope um, and, and sort of uh, continue to deliver and I think in finance particularly, um, you know, you, you a lot of the early finance roles are individual contributor roles. Yeah, it's just but you're a specialist. Uh, uh, it's quite unusual to have you know large teams until you have a, a degree of seniority, um, and then you sort of jump into to the the, the team. Um, but unless you learn to kind of uh, trust your team um, and you know, really build them to be um, your replacement, if you like, then uh, I think it becomes very challenging. And I'll just give an example. So G Treasury have just gone through a recap process. You'll see you do lots of planning. You know, you've planned out, you know, when, when the materials are going to go out, when the offers are going to come in, when all of the, uh, the, the process is going to, going to run. Um, and around that planning, I was picking up my daughter um, from her, myself, husband and I picking up my daughter from a freshman year at uh, a college. And, you know, the, pl- the, ta- the timing and the planning looked absolutely perfect because we thought it was in the pause period when there was going to be a bunch of negotiation going on um, between our, well, the, the bankers we pointed and, you know, prospective buyers. But as you expect, curveball wasn't to happen someone basically, you know, got in and got ahead of it. So there we are really noodling out the last bits of this uh, of this major deal. And we're talking like <laughs> loads of money on the table. And um, my husband and I are driving uh, through the countryside. So you can imagine this. So I get out the front of the car. I'm in the back of the car. You know, get the hotspot on, get the laptop up. Um, I don't know if any of your viewers are like fans of things like the Lincoln Lawyer. Yeah, imagine Lincoln Lawyer, but a Ford Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is, you know, we're driving through a beautiful countryside to uh, to get to uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont, my uh, my daughter's at UVM. And um, I would say cell reception, not so hot. So to me, it was brilliant. I could have my two top lieutenants on the call with me and even if I was cutting in and out they would be representing you know the finance function and G Treasury in an amazing way um, and we got a great deal done and I think it's really you know them being able to uh, being able to kind of step up into that role and me just having that degree of trust and confidence that I, I knew they'd do a great job um, that really got this done you can imagine if not, it would have been awful, you know, panicking what I'm going to do. I like pull into Starbucks and like spend the day. It, it just wasn't going to happen. So, you know, making sure you've built a team and trust that team and give them the tools they, they, they need to be successful and potentially, you know, do your job for you is exactly what it's about. So. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to jump to our business segment now where our I just begin by asking you about G Treasury. Tell us about this company. What are its offerings today and what what is it about? So G Treasury is a SaaS platform, a technology platform um, that's in the office of the CFO. Okay. So I'd like to describe it as it is the center of cash, which is different from, you know, standard ERP. 
it's your center of cash for your CFO. And what that enables is the CFOs to automate treasury, automate things like financial risk, you know, debt books and, uh, and, and how they manage their debt books, uh, automation of working capital and automation of payments operations. So why do you put something like a G treasury in? Um, as a CFO, what it lets you do is um, optimize your earnings because you can put uh, your cash to work more easily. Um, it's much easier to invest in growth when you understand you know, where your pots of, of cash are and how much you've got. Um, and it allows you to kind of optimize your, your capital structures. And it, it's like slightly one of those bizarre things. Um, you know, I'm a CFO and we basically work with CFOs. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, G Treasury in my mind is, is, is a way where, uh, you know, CFOs get to lead by example in, in a whole bunch of, uh, of areas. Um, so, for example, now, um, yeah, economic cycles go through sort of ebbs and flows. And clearly top of mind at the moment, you know, I saw the news on Amazon this morning, is it's all about driving productivity. So, you know, G Treasury is a, is a product that allows you to drive productivity in finance. So in your own right. So you're kind of leading by examples. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a great place to be. But you know, I always think there's just too many CFOs in the whole thing. We're like, <laughs> CFO, <laughs> meeting CFOs. It's like, how many light bulbs does it take? Or how many CFOs does it take to put a light bulb in? Um, I'm not quite sure. So, is this um, the first time the, the the company's offerings that a company you've been with are, are targeting the CFO, or it's about the CFO office? Had you had that in a prior life, or no? So this is completely, you know, this space is new for me. Um, but it, it's it's like like I say, it's that it's that uh, uh, dichotomy of like I am a CFO, um, and so I kind of understand the space that I'm in. And I'm working with CFOs. We uh, obviously use G Treasury our, ourselves. So, you know, I'm a user of our product here. Yeah. So you're very familiar with it. And tell us something about the the capital structure, uh, a history of it over time. How did this company get established and where it is today? And again, you've been, you've been with uh, G Treasury now for uh, five and a half, nearly five and a half years, I think. That's um, correct. And it, perhaps you were... a uh, were you a geography CFO earlier with the same company or, and by that, you know, a, a geographic, no CFO from the day you stepped in. Yep. So yes, I was a, I was a regional CFO for, you know, a large business before I pivoted into, um, into G Treasury. So G Treasury is my first true hundred uh, percent buck stops, stops here. Um, uh, CFO. Oh, you're five and a half years down as a, you know, the buck stops here CFO, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I actually, so I did my first 25 years in, um, you know, big corporates, which is great because it, it teaches you like what does good look like at like, sort of massive scale, um, as well as kind of how do you get there in terms of scaling from, from smaller to, to bigger. Um, so in pivoting to join G Treasury, I actually am uh, joining a, um, it, as I joined, it was private equity backed. But its origins are in a family firm. Yeah, so it's founder led originally um, until it was um, uh, invested in by private equity back in about 2017. Um, and the first uh, private equity partners were main sale partners. Um, which is a great company, um, and their specialty is to invest in um, founder um, technology um, platforms. That's their sweet spot. They don't look at anything else because what they want to be able to do is help those businesses which are uh, cash-constrained, capital-constrained um, in their sort of early life moving into that more professional world of, uh, of, of, of uh, private equity owned. So they're usually first time owners of, um, of, of uh, founder their companies. And then um, as I was talking about just briefly ago about you know, the back seat of my Ford Explorer, um, the, the, the business recapitalized to a bigger private equity partner, HD Capital out of the UK. So 
feels like I'm kind of circling around, coming back home again. Um, who are who are great now because they're at that next stage of growth. So they're really helping us scale uh, further and further. But interestingly enough, main cell partners um, like the business so much and the space, uh, and obviously the the management team that that we've uh, we've assembled between myself and, and and the CEO that they've continued to stay invested in. Um, G Treasury is a minor partner. So we are now still private equity backed by HG Capital out of the UK with a minor partner, um, main cell partners. Um, so great setup. We want to uh, quickly touch on with you uh, the metrics that are important to you. We know this is a SaaS company and we know that the unit economics are. Uh, but what we're looking, and now that you've been tracking this company for quite a while, We'd be very interested in understanding if there's a perhaps a new metric or a metric that you've raised the profile of over the last couple of years anyway to help the organization understand better the nature of the business or how it's performing better. I don't know, but can you share with us a metric that you have helped champion or make top of mind or educate the organization a little differently about so they can better respond to it? I think a lot of CFOs would probably the same say the same thing is, you know, a lot of finance metrics are rear view mirror. They're the outcome. Yeah. So you get the outcome and that's fine. But if you want really good metrics to steer and move your business ahead, they have to be what you would call leading indicators. Now, you know, I don't think there's there's anybody that has got anything absolutely unique. Um in, in leading indicators. But if I'm looking forward and I want to plan forward, uh, and that's the best way of being able to, you know, allocate your resources better if you, if you do, you know, if I'm looking at the kind of two-year horizons, I want all of the metrics that are on the front-end revenue. So whether it's things like, you know, pipeline, pipeline generation, you know, number of leads, conversion rates, these are absolutely top of mind to help us map out what we see as the revenue flow. Okay, Once you've got the revenue flow, it's very easy to then say, well, how much does that mean we've got to spend? <laughs> so, And you can allocate your, uh, your resources to your, your priorities. If I want to look further than my uh, two years, it's very much more driven then by pure market. So making sure the business is being um, uh, very uh, structured in its approach to the market, make sure you get you know market sizing regularly. Make sure you get market velocity regularly. Understand what's happening out there, as well as the kind of nearer term leading indicators like pipeline, lead generation, lead conversion. Then you have your know, kind of financials that are the outcome at the end. So I think it's really important you have those um, time-bound kind of measures. So furthest out, next in, you know, outcome. So I wouldn't specifically hone in on one individual thing, but I would say you've got to have those buckets that you're measuring and managing and keeping front of mind as you as you go through. Can you tell us something about your FP&A team, if you've organized it differently or, you know, have you taken a – uh, anything from your past and modified it in some way under, as you grew to understand this market, here's where we need our, our planning people. What, what would you tell us? So, I mean, the FP&A, part of the trick is to make sure that you have someone that partners really well. So, you know, what did I take from my old business? Well, uh, my head of FP&A for a start. <laughs> there is the insight, but there's also the how do you partner? Um, so there's both the, you know, there's the metrics and there's the, the, the data. Um, and, you know, Rick is, is really good at, at that piece. Um, and, you know, setting our systems up so they surface the data up really, really quickly. Um, but then it's how do you work with each part of the organization to make them, you know, bring them with you in your understanding that says, okay, so you've got options. You know, if you do this, you know, <laughs> you're going to run out of money. If you do that, you know, probably okay, but we're probably not going to grow enough. So 
in Rick, what I've got is somebody where, you know, everybody loves Rick. They go to him for advice. <laughs> um, and he works that angle really well. Um, so I get to be a little bit bad cop because he'll sit down with them very consultatively and say, well, yeah, you probably don't want to be asking Hillary for that. <laughs> well, that's your plays into this question I always <laughs> like to ask, which is uh, Rick has his team down the hall in a conference room and Hillary swings open the door. What's going through everyone's mind? What is Hillary about to ask for? Wow. What would I ask for? Um, you know, again, one of the things that, you know, I like to do is we always have a morning stand up as a team every day, um, just to keep ourselves up to breast with, you know, this is, this is where we're going. This is, um, you know, this is what we're going to need. Here are the big events coming up in the future. Um, I, I think what I'm looking for is that are they proactive? Yeah. Rather than, you know, Hillary is going to ask for this. What I'm looking for is them going, all right, we've done the results. You know, we're off plan here. Um, and we think it's X, Y, and Z. So for example, at the moment, um, you know, our, our biggest variance at the moment is in our um, services revenue. That's project revenue where we help implement our own our, our own software. Um, we need to understand, you know, are we going to get more of that or not? Um, and it can come from multiple sources. So to me, it's like walking into the room and they're going, yeah, we've looked at, you know, how much is in the project that we're still working on? And here are the new projects. And then if we do the math on it, you know, this is what we're projecting for the whole year. Rather than me coming along going, uh, right, we've got a variance, please go and do your homework. So what I'm really looking for is people being more proactive and not waiting for me to say, oh, I think this is the top of mind question because they see it straight away and they already go digging and they have the answer before I turn up. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. We're going to jump to our finance strategic moment question where we ask you just for a, one moment of insight that you've experienced during your career. It might have happened 20 years ago. might have happened last week. Anything come to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? I, I'd certainly class it as a moment. Um, I think the strategic part came a little bit bit later, but let me, let me talk about the moment. Um, again, it was when I was uh, in Asia Pacific. And as I mentioned, there was, there was a little bit of, uh, little bit of, of cleanup to do. Um, but the, the general manager of the Philippines phoned me up and, uh, and uh, she said, uh, Larry, I don't know what to do. There's no money in the bank account and all the finance team have disappeared. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, long story short, because, you know, the classic financials that were coming through in terms of your P&L and uh, through your ERP and all that, that, that uh, type of stuff did not show there was no money in the bank account. So the finance team had systematically been defrauding uh, the organization over a period of about five years. Um, they were very, very skilled finance people, but they were using it nefariously. And, you know, once the cash ran out, <laughs> they ran. So... You know, obviously, you have to kind of uh, you have to kind of jump in, and it gave me a platform basically to to go in there and start to implement changes that are much more traditional. So segregation of duties. You know, we set up a call center which was cross border. So you know, both the you know, acknowledgement to spend and the actual you know sending the payment split by geography. So there was no way you could have a kind of collusive entire kind of finance team anymore. So these are kind of more traditional ways of, of, of managing controls. And we did a kind of control study across uh, all of the organization to actually start to um, uh, bring up and, and, and remediate where some of this um, less than um, stellar behavior was going on. But the strategic moment to me is when I joined the treasury. Um, and I realized that if we'd had G Treasury in this situation, it could never have happened because G Treasury is the center of cash, which means every day you have real time 
um, balances from all of your bank accounts. There's no way someone could be nefariously siphoning all that off for five years with no one, you know, in using their accounting skills effectively to cover it up. So it really taught me the power of something like a G Treasury tool, which, like I say, focuses on cash, what's going on um, in, uh, uh, in at the bank accounts, which ultimately is, you know, is the product of, of, of what you're doing when you're, you're doing business, versus an ERP, which... Again, it's centered very much more around accounting and how you present your results to the world. So it really flicked a switch in my head about, wow, as a finance professional, there are multiple ways to look at a business. And I hadn't even considered that G Treasury, center of cash, and what you do and what you can manage um, from that perspective is, is very different. So... This episode is presented by Avalere Ah. That's the sound of not worrying about sales tax compliance. Because when you automate it with Avalara, you don't have to worry about collecting sales tax or tracking who and what is tax exempt. With Avalara, you don't even have to worry about new tax laws and regulations. Avalara does it for you. If your business sells internationally, Avalara has you covered with cross-border tax compliance solutions. And when it comes time to file tax returns, Avalara automatically takes care of that too, giving you one less thing to worry about. Avalara has managed billions of sales for small, mid-size, and enterprise businesses and seamlessly works with your current sales, e-commerce, and accounting platforms. Take the worry out of tax compliance with Avalara. Ah. Learn more at avalara.com. That's A-V-A-L-A-R-A dot com. Uh, we're going to jump to our mentoring round where we'll now ask you several quick questions intended to inform and inspire future finance leaders. And since we're just talking about G Treasury uh, and uh, your first 30 to 60 days there, again, this was uh, perhaps your first CFO, you alone are the CFO role. What when you think back, there must have been something you wish someone had told you. And we're going to give you a pass here. You get to go back in time and, and, and whisper this in your ear. I'm, I wish I knew this. Um, I think um, I inherited a great team. That was, uh, that was, that was one of the things that, that I would say stepping in. Um, but uh, it, what really blew me away is I, I started to kind of uh, like step into uh, step into G Treasury is that for, you know, it was a business that was working in multi-geography. So it was, uh, it was in Australia, it was in the UK, it was in, here in the, in the, in the, in the US. Um, but it was still operating on spreadsheet. <laughs> um, predominantly. So it's like, how can you run a multi-jurisdiction business on a spreadsheet? Yeah. And it, so there'd been a, like a little bit of, yeah, yeah, no, we, we, you know, <laughs> We, we do have a, a, a kind of an ERP. Yeah, not really. So, you know, the first thing that I had to do at, at G Treasury is is really put some of the foundational things in from a system perspective. So, you know, you can't do it on day one, but we probably spent the first year because we had to bring, you know, an ERP system in across the, uh, across the organization. We still spent the first year really running the business on a spreadsheet. The first thing I did in my first 90 days was actually build a better spreadsheet, by the way. <laughs> Hadn't cool. really expected to do that. That was kind of like, you know, real flashback to, you know, probably my first FP&A role. <laughs> How good are my Excel skills still? Um, so, uh, but then getting quickly behind it, you know, infrastructure that allows you to operate across these multi-jurisdictions, you know, use different accounting standards because it's IFRS in you know uh, Australia and uh, and uh, uh, EMEA, it's US GAAP here in the US. So that can handle multi accounting standards. It can handle consolidation, multi currency. Um, so get that in, and that is your foundation then to scale. Um, and one of the things we've been able to do is we've like trebled in size. Um, we've done three or four acquisitions. 
and we've done it all off that backbone we put in in the first year. So it's the same team, same size, same scale, but we've gobbled up three or four other businesses and we've trebled in size. So um, great, great story. Uh, we always like to touch a little bit on the personal side. We're wondering if there's something perhaps most people don't know about you, something uh, even your colleagues might not know about you. Don't know. Anything come to mind? Yeah, I, we touched on it a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't think most people would have realized that, you know, I started life as an academic scientist at Oxford University in the field of biochemistry and molecular biology. <laughs> I usually blow their mind a little bit. But, you know, I think the skills that you learn are very, very transferable into, um, into business and, and into finance particularly. So, you know, when I was doing research during my, during my PhD, um, you know, you'd start with go do the research, the book research, you know, formulate a hypothesis and then go test it. Yeah. Now you do experiments. Here we do test it in the marketplace or, you know, make a plan. And then, you know, you reiterate, you reiterate that kind of discipline, that kind of approach. It, it's the same as doing business. So I think it gave, you know, a way of thinking about problems that is very, very transferable. Um, so that's probably my fun fact. I was a scientist. Excellent. Would you have a, a book selection for us? Anything uh, might be something you escape with or it could be a business book. Doesn't matter. It is a business book. I actually brought it with me. Okay. She's got a copy. It's Getting Naked with uh, Lencioni. Um, and why do I, you know, why would I say that? And I, I don't want to spoil it. It's, it's a great read, by the way, for everybody. So, like, it's a good story. It's not a dry kind of business book. It's a great story. Um, why I like it so much is I think as finance people, we like black and white. We like numbers. Um, and we're very comfortable in what, uh, like, the IQ side of, of life. The one thing I would say is that, you know, as a leader in a finance function, you're you're effectively an internal consultant <laughs> to the business. And getting the numbers should be table stakes, whether it's assembling data about or market data, whether it's assembling, you know, financials. That's not, that, that should be table stakes for us as a finance function. Then what you do with it and how you, you move forward as that consultant is what differentiates you. And... That, the book, again, don't want to put any spoilers out there, I think uh, shows you different ways of approaching that problem of internal consultancy. It's external consultancy, but you need to apply it internally. Um, and teaches you a little bit more, I think, about the EQ side of success than the IQ side of success. That's why I like it. So. Nice. Excellent. Uh, we are up to our final question. Sorry we ran a little long. It's entirely my fault. Um would like to know what your priorities as CFO of G Treasury are over the next 12 months. So my uh, priority is actually aligned. First of all, you know, your priorities are the business priorities. <laughs> so the business priorities are really around growth and profitable growth. Um, so it's really how do we help the business const constantly looking ahead? Um, how's that growth coming? where's the next best dollar invested in that growth um, to kind of push the flywheel as, as much as possible. Alongside that, you know, I think it's really important that you're constantly evaluating your, um, your, your business and constantly looking at, you know, how do I improve? How do I improve the fabric of it? Um, well, I, I also cover legal um, as part of my remit as, as CFO. So um, one of the areas we're really looking to try and drive some efficiency and improvement is, is in the legal function. So again, very much on my kind of like system first uh, you know, approach, we're looking at an AI-based system tool. Um, I won't give you the brand name because I don't know whether they can or not. Um, but we're looking at an AI-based system tool that uses machine learning to help manage our you know vast repository of um contracts that we we have in place um and there's some great tools out there but it's it's a great way to use ai um or ml it should be machine learning um to really sort of 
improve productivity of the team. Um, and I know, you know, it's been in the legal space for quite a, quite a while, so there's some, some really good products out there. Um, but I expect it to make a, you know, a significant difference to how fast we can manage contracts um, and how much we spend with our legal partners um, in, in terms of, uh, of, of what we do in uh, contracting with clients. So, Hillary Norris, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you very much. It was a delightful to be here. Hello, Thought Leader listeners. We hope 2024 is treating you well. If you haven't already, we hope you'll pay a visit to CFOThoughtLeader.com and go ahead and subscribe to our Mentoring Round newsletter, where we highlight the career lessons and moments of strategic insight shared by our recent CFO guests. Also, LinkedIn users, please go ahead and follow our CFO Thought Leader company page, and you'll be certain not to miss a single Thought Leader video debut. CFO Thought Leader, the number one thought leadership platform exclusively for and by CFOs. As always, thank you for listening.